Good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, National Science Week, and we're here today for a fantastic couple of hours of focusing in on two of our most uh, beautiful bird species that we find here in the southeast, the glossy black cockatoo and the gang gang. Uh, my name's Doug Record. I'm your Zoom host for today. And the good news is that I'll disappear shortly and I just sit in the background and you'll get to hear from some really interesting and wonderful people. Um, I'd just like to start off proceedings by showing my respect uh, and acknowledging the traditional custodians. Uh, I'm based here at Bournda National Park at the Bournda Environmental Education Centre. Um, and uh, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians, the Dirigange people of the Yuan Nation and uh, to extend those acknowledgements to any Aboriginal persons present. Uh, just in terms of some basic housekeeping stuff, We've got um, chat available for you. If you've got a question, um, you can put it in chat. And there is also, you should have access to a Q&A button on your presentation where you can also put questions, um, probably housekeeping stuff. If there's something that you, you need addressed, you can put in the chat and Q&A for the questions, but either, either way, we'll get to them uh, because I'm experimenting. I um, uh, was going to put up a poll uh, just for you to have a quick look at. I saw a glossy black cockatoo in the past 55 minutes, in the past 24 hours, in the past week, in the past month, in the past year. So the most recent sighting is what we're after. Let's just have a quick look and see if anyone's had the good fortune of seeing one. I, I mean, you could um, refer to a sighting on iNaturalist if you did see one in the past five minutes and then we know you were genuine. Um, but I'm going to uh, try and share the results and this is where my limitations <laughs> will come through. Um, we've got um, two people, 10% have seen one in the past 24 hours uh, and 35% uh, of the participants have seen um, one in the past year. So we get them here at Bournda. I was going to be sitting outside because sometimes they're in the black butts here and they rain down the uh, nuts of the black butts that, as they've been sitting up there eating the fruit and uh, it's too windy out there, so I'm indoors. So look, our moderator for today is Mike Jefferis. Um, I'm going to hand over to you, Mike, and you can introduce our speakers for our first session. Uh, thanks, Doug. I'm Mike Jeffress. I'm a member of the Committee of Butterwang Coast Atlas of Life, also a member of BirdLife Shoalhaven. And I'm particularly happy to introduce the speakers on the Glossies in the Mist project because I do love Glossies. We used to see them around here in Ulladulla quite often, a few times a year three of them, usually three, always three. Since the fires, we've seen them almost every day. Uh, and the biggest number I've seen in one go is was 28. So what are some of the, one of the things I would li like to know about Glossies in the Mist, I just love the name Glossies in the Mist and I'd like to know where that came from. So I'll introduce the speakers. They're Lauren Hook is an ecologist. <coughs> and a Saving Our Species and Threatened Species Officer working with the New South Wales Department of Planning, Industry and the Environment. Lauren manages a suite of diverse threatened flora and fauna projects in the Illawarra and Southern Highlands. Erna is a member of BirdLife Southern Highlands and a volunteer with the Glossies in the Mist Project. And she's a passionate believer in the value of citizen science. So Lauren, I think is going first. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Um, just waiting for our slides to come up. Oh, there we go. Awesome. I'll just answer your question quickly about the the name, Doug. Um, our team Mike. was sorry, Mike. Sorry. Um, our team was sitting in the pizza shop in Robinson called Pizzas in the Mist, and was dreaming up this project. And so it sort of ended up being Glossies in the Mist, also because there's lots of mist up in the Southern Highlands. So yeah, um, good day everyone. My name is Lauren Hook. I'm the Threatened Species Officer working on the Glossies in the Mist project. And I'll be talking to you today about how to identify a glossy black cockatoo 
the outcomes of our project so far, and then I'll be handing you over to one of our amazing volunteers, Anna Lenore, to talk to you about the community-led photo identification project. Firstly, I'd just like to acknowledge that our work has been undertaken on Gundungo country up in the Southern Highlands. Yeah. All right, so glossies in a nutshell. They're vulnerable in New South Wales and endangered federally. Um, they're the smallest of our five black uh, cockatoos in Australia. And in our area and on the south coast of Eastern New South Wales, they're the only one with a red tail. So it makes them pretty easy to identify. Um, they eat only species of she-oak, different species of she-oak. So in our area, they eat um, Alicajarina littoralis, which is black she-oak, and also Viticillata, which is the drooping she-oak. Um, and they have a really cool modified bill so they can hold the, the she-oak cones and they, they rip it open and then they get at the little nuts. And that's what you can see underneath the, the foraging feed trees that they have been feeding in. Um, Another thing is that they bond for life. So around two, they'll mate up and then they'll stay with that partner for the rest of their, their lives. And the longest um, recorded wild glossy was 34. She was a banded glossy down in Kangaroo Island, but we reckon they probably live for a lot longer than that. That's just what we know about. Um, they raise one chick a year and they need a really deep, large hollow, um, an upright hollow as well. So they're a bit specific with their hollows and their feed. Um, which makes them vulnerable. Um, and like most other birds, oh, that's their flight call as well. <laughs> Thanks, Anna. Um, and like most other birds, the female glossy is the most colourful of the pair and they have patches of yellow plumage on their heads um, that are individual. So you can see that, that glossy in the middle there, she's the female and you can see her juvenile up the branch from her as well. The younger birds have more banding in their tails. So you can see that juvenile has a light color in its tail and also lots more banding than the male that's further down the, the branch that has almost no banding in the tail. And the females usually have a bit more orange and yellow in their tails and the males generally don't have, they just have red. So yeah. <laughs> then flying away again. <laughs> so the Glossies in the Mist project is a Saving Our Species project and it's a landscape um, program working across the Southern Highlands. Um, it focuses on the Great Western Wildlife Corridor, which you can see in the map there with the, the nice yellow arrow going through it. So it's a vegetative corridor that links up the Blue Mountains Wilderness Area in the north to the to Morton Wilderness Area in the south. And it runs through the western side of Winter Caribbean Shire, a little bit into Goulburn at the bottom. And it's got a whole lot of different people living on that land. So it's a lot of private land. There's some state forests, there's some national parks, there's a lot of council reserves as well. But it's pretty much why we needed a big community engagement project to really get that community to understand, you know, what glossy feeding habitat looks like and how to protect it. Um, so we started off by training the community on how to recognize glossies and um, the chewings under the trees as well. And suddenly everyone started reporting them. Before the project, there was about 20 sightings recorded in Bionet. And now we have over 800 sightings of glossies. And so that's not just individual birds, that's just sightings of them. And over 100, oh no, sorry, over a thousand feed trees as well recorded and protected in Bionet. Um, the project also has an amazing photo identification project in it as well, which catalogues um, individual females by their facial color. And so far we've got 180 individual females um, identified and Erna's going to tell you all about that in a sec as well. Um, also throughout the corridor our team goes and surveys 127 sites to identify if there's significant foraging habitat there so that we can map it and protect it and out of all of these sites just over half of them have, a, have active feed trees in them. So it shows that the glossies are actually accessing um, foraging habitat throughout the whole section of the corridor. Um, and it also allows us to work out if there's areas that need revegetation or protection. Um, and it allows us to track their activity over time as well. So we have surveyed this area before the fires and after the fires. And quite interestingly, it's been used about the same across the, um, across the corridor, but more significantly in the southern area, there's been a lot of feeding down there, which is just adjacent to the, to the Morton Burn. Um, after the fires as well, because the fires did affect the Morton area at the, at the south and the 
Blue Mountains Wilderness Area at the north, but the main section of the corridor was not burnt. And so that actually is now acting as this big um, refuge for not only glossies, but a whole lot of other fauna as well. And so we decided we'd uh, undertake a nest box trial because there has been successful nest box programs in other areas, but we just didn't know if our glossies were gonna use them and if there was threats associated with us putting nest boxes up. So we really wanted to um, have a scientific um, trial where we monitored the nest boxes. And so we use motion sensor cameras above the nest, nest boxes to see what's using them and see what interactions are happening there. Um, and they've been up for just over a year now. So they're halfway through their second breeding season. Um, and we haven't had glossies in them yet. We've had glossies around the boxes and feeding in trees near them, but we haven't had them nesting in them. Um, there's been quite a few possums breeding in them and a couple of other birds as well. But um, we're just sort of monitoring for the next stage of if we are gonna do some adaptive management with them. Um, another really big part of the Glossies in the Mist project is planting trees. And so to date, we've planted almost 20,000 trees to enhance foraging habitat, and nesting habitat of glossies across the corridor. Um, and we've undertaken two mass plantings in a highly fragmented area. And we've also secured funding for a further 10 over this year. So hopefully COVID permitting, we will be able to get in there and make some really good connections within the fragmented parts of the corridor. And so, I'm just gonna hand over to Erna now, who's gonna talk about the female glossy identification project. Thanks so much for listening to me. Hi everybody, I'm Erna, as Lauren said, I'm part of a group of volunteers uh, who've become involved with the Glossies in the Mist project. Lauren fondly calls us the Glossy Gang, which we're quite happy to take as a name. I'm hoping that today, what I can do is tell you about our part, the Glossy ID part of the project, and inspire you to um, come along on the, on the journey and do something similar down in your area. Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> Haven't been doing enough talking today. So, oh, three reasons why I love Glossy Black Cockatoos. <coughs> First reason, if you're a birder, you know that when you go out to photograph birds, you get your camera on the bird, you get it zoomed in, you're in focus, you're about to push the button and the bird flies away. Glossy black cockatoos stay in the tree for hours. I've had photographers say, I was out for a walk, I saw some glossies. So I went home and got my camera and came back and took these photos for you. I mean, what's not to like as a bird, a bird that stays in the tree? Second reason to love glossy blacks, as Lauren said, they all have individual markings. The females can be recognized as individuals. You know, any other time you go birding, you see a golden whistler in a tree, you walk 500 meters, you see another one and you've got no idea if it's the same bird or a different bird. But with glossies, if you've taken a photo, you can really get a good sense of how many birds are around, uh, where they're moving, what they're doing. I, I just love them for that. It's great to be identify, able to identify individuals without putting uh, trackers on them or banding them or anything else. Third reason to love glossy black cockatoos, they're always smiling. Just look at that face. How could you not fall in love with a glossy black cockatoo? This is Babe, she was my gateway drug into the Glossies in the Mist project. Lauren and a colleague came to our bird club and told us about the project and asked us to submit sightings or photos of glossies that we'd seen. So I sent Lauren this photo of a bird I'd photographed only a short time before. And after a couple of days, she got back to me and said that this was a new bird that she hadn't been seen before uh, and that she was new to the project and would I like to give her a name? So I named her Babe, I got a little dopamine hit and I just thought, this is what I want to do. I want to go and find glossies. I want to see if I can find Babe somewhere else, see who else I can find out there. Uh, so yeah, this is Babe, she's my, my first glossy. Before we move on, I'll, I'll just point out to you this little notch in their lower jaw 
uh, that Lauren talked before about them eating the nuts. And as I go through the slides, I'll explain to you about this notch a little further. This is the distribution of glossy black cockatoos. And one of the things that I didn't understand about distribution maps initially was that this doesn't mean that everywhere you see those purple marks, you'll find glossies. It just means that sometimes, in some cases, they may have been seen there once, that's all. Uh, so really, although it looks like a big distribution, it's only going to be in patches throughout that area where you're going to see them. But you can see that you guys down on the south coast have got a nice patch down there, and I'm sure there are plenty of glossies down there for you to find. As Lauren said, we work in the Great Western Wildlife Corridor, which is this yellowy area on the map. It's essentially equates to the Windy Caribbean Shire Council area, although we do push the boundaries a little bit on that corridor. Uh, we volunteers have broken this corridor up. Uh, we have the north, the central and the southern corridor. I'm doing most of my glossy ID work in the central corridor with a couple of other women. But there's one, one volunteer, Kay, up in the north, who is working up there identifying primarily glossies who are on her own property. She's lucky enough to have glossies coming into a dam at her place. And she's doing a, a big study on um, who's coming in, who they come in with, when they come in, which trees they prefer in the area. And she's just getting an amazing amount of data up there and learning heaps of stuff for us. Down in the south, we have another volunteer who's doing a lot of glossy ID work in, um, oh, just right down in that southern area. In the centre, there's three of us working there doing glossy ID work, and we have a number of glossies that have been picked up <clears throat> in that area. Glossies have done themselves a disservice by being very picky eaters. Uh, unfortunately, they only like certain allocasuarinas. The, the one you can see in the image is the littoralis, which is the one that we've got most commonly in our area. Really, the, the essence of the whole overall project is retaining and restoring as much of this habitat as we possibly can. So we really, we're trying hard to track where, where these food trees are and where the birds are eating them in them. We, we sometimes find food trees and there's no evidence of eating, but in other areas, it's quite clear the birds have been there quite a lot of the time. And, it's really important for us to document that so that we can protect these feeding areas. On the right hand side of the image there, you'll see the nuts that they like. So they, they come into the tree, uh, usually in a group, and they will sit there for hours and hours just working their way through the tree. They pick off a single nut, uh, cone with their left claw, uh, the left foot, and they've put it up to the beak and rest it in that notch that I was talking about earlier on, scrape off all that hard outside and work their way down to the seed. Fortunately, the, uh, the good side of that is that they leave a lot of evidence on the ground after they've been chewing. I should also mention that if you get your ear in, you, you can hear them chewing. If you walk quietly through the bush, which is a little bit hard for my group, um, you will actually latch onto the sound of them chewing and you can go and find them. It's the sound of these chewings dropping to the ground. So this is a, a carpet that we would classify as low to medium in density. Sometimes once a group's been sitting in a tree for a few hours, you get a beautiful dense carpet of these, these chewings underneath. And it, this is a really important sighting. It's, it's really, more important to find chewings than it is to find birds. And I'll explain that as we go along. So in, on the right-hand side of that slide, you'll see up the top are fresh chewings. They're probably 24 hours old or less. In the middle, the orange ones are aging. So the birds have been in that tree or in that area in the last week or so. And then as time goes by, the 
colour of the chewings changes. If we've seen, or if anyone's seen chewings under trees, then, as I said, that tells us that birds have been, in, been eating in that area. And so that's a really important site. We need to keep a record of that so that nothing can be done to harm that feeding area. So we have this uh, website available online and we ask people to record sightings of chewings or of glossies. And down there on the right hand corner, people can access the website and provide some information. Uh, so they will record chewings for us or if we're really lucky, they'll actually record a sighting of birds for us. <clears throat> uh, there's opportunity on that website to uh, upload a photo, but if people have got a number of photos, we'll get in contact with them and make arrangements for them to send the photos to us uh, so that we can do a little bit more analysis. That's when we all come into the picture. This is the Glossy Gang. This is exactly what we look like. Uh, we each work on identifying the glossies in our area and trying to establish whether the photo that we've got this time is a new flossy, as we call them, uh, or a, a new sighting of a previous bird. The first thing that we do is double check that it really is a glossy. Uh, although Lauren said that glossies are the only black cockatoos in our area with red tails, I think lots of people in the public just focus on the idea of the yellow colouring on their heads. Uh, so we do get reports of yellow-tailed black cockatoos uh, as well. I recently got called by someone who said, oh, quick, quick, there's some glossies near me feeding in an Allo Cajarina. So I grabbed the camera and off I went. And when I got there, it was a beautiful group of yellow-tailed black cockatoos feeding in a hakia. So unfortunately, not every uh, sighting is a glossy, as much as I love yellow-tails. So I explained to you before that uh, we've divided the corridor into three parts uh, and each of us in our sections has created what we call a lookbook, which is kind of um, a, a book of mug shots of the flossies that we've had reported or recorded to date. Um, this is the one for the central corridor where I work with a couple of good friends. Uh, each, each Flossie has her own page in our lookbook. I should mention that we have a team lookbook, which has got lots of information on every page, but we've also got a stripped down version that's available online so that if anyone's taken a photo of a glossy black, they can access the lookbook for their area and just have a bit of a look through and see whether they think they've got a new girl or whether they've got a new sighting of a known bird. So this is Molly, as you can see, we've tried to identify important um, aspects of her coloration that will help us when we're wanting to compare her with another girl. Uh, we try and get, if we can, once each side, a photo of each side of her face because uh, her individual colorings are also not symmetrical. So the left side can, can look quite different to the right side. Uh, and we like a, a full length tail shot as well. Uh, then we have a look at the new bird that we've got and decide whether we're going to classify her as uh, her, her density of coloration as low, mid or high coloration. And we'll hone in on those um, mug shots in the lookbook in that segment to make our comparisons. As Lauren said, we've now, we're now up to 180 birds. So it's actually quite a lot to work through uh, to see if we can work out if, they're, if we've got a new girl or not. This is a, a nice display of an ideal collection of um, glossy photos. If we can, we love it if we can get really good clear shots of each side and a, a face on shot. But it's really hard and uh, flossies are really hard to photograph. They're frequently in toward the center of the tree and frequently, you know, it's primarily needles that you get and we're almost out with a microscope trying to see her markings. 
this is an example of how it is not easy. <clears throat> the um, Flossie that we've got in the middle here, which we call probably Penny, uh, is a photo that we had submitted. Uh, we had her, this was a historic photo. And subsequently, someone took a, a photo of a bird out uh, in the wild and uh, sent it into us. And we thought, oh, you know, maybe this is the one we've got in the middle here, probably Penny. But as you'll see, she hasn't got quite as much color around the back of her nape even though she's got that quite distinctive eyebrow and the spot behind it. So we, we just really can't be sure if this is the same bird. And then uh, this photo down on the side, this was submitted by my Pilates teacher because I just can't help evangelizing about glossies wherever I go. And Emma um, saw this bird and took a photo just with her iPhone, uh, which is fabulous, I was really pleased. Uh, but as you can see, it's not super clear and we just can't be sure it could well be Penny. She was seen in the same area, but we, we don't know for sure. Sometimes we can be really confident, other times we can't. Let's take that one back. This is one of our more embarrassing stories. This is Winifred. Winifred was first photographed in um, Mittagong, not that far away. Uh, and then some months later, we photo or someone else photographed her quite a long way away down in Penrose. And because we, we haven't got these birds in a confined area, we, we don't know much about how far they travel. So we were really excited when Winifred turned up down in Penrose. And um, this, she was sort of famous for being the bird that had traveled the furthest distance. And we put Facebook posts out about her. We wrote her up in the newsletter, Winifred's flown 17 kilometers and isn't she special? And then when we gained a bit more expertise and Linda, one of our girls, uh, Glossy's uh, gang in the central corridor was starting to do some tail studies. We went back and had another look at these two photos and appreciated that Winifred has got the tail of a somewhat older female and the bird that we've now had to call Frida, uh, who is not Winifred at all, has got much more of a juvenile's uh, tail. So we don't get it right all the time. If we work through our lookbooks and we uh, can't find a good match or even a, a close match, then we'll write back to the photographer and congratulate them and tell them that they've found a flossy that we didn't know about before. And, you know, it's just fantastic when that happens. We really love it. We ask the photographer to give the bird a name and she enters into our database, uh, you know, until the next time we get a sighting. Uh, if it's a re-sighting of a flossy, we'll write back and tell the photographer that. We also write to the original photographer and let them know that their bird's been re-sighted in a new spot and what's been happening. Sometimes we've had birds re-sighted with a juvenile the next time, uh, that sort of stuff. I, th I think that this is a really valuable part of the project in that you can ask birders to log sightings of glossy black cockatoos uh, and, and they'll do it for a while. But if they're getting feedback and they want to know if it's a new bird or, you know, what's happened to their old bird, then they're much more likely to be retained. This is, this is what's kept me going. You know, has someone sighted my bird? Have I found an, a new bird? Um, how far have they flown? What have they been doing? So to my mind, this is an investment that um, volunteers can make. We can afford to spend the time to keep our photographers engaged and informed about what's going on. Uh, and I, I think that keeps the enthusiasm rolling. The project's been going for over three and a half years now. And I know that if it was simply a matter of me logging sightings, I probably would have given it away. But we've all made attachments and we're all, you know, passing on information about birds. And I, I think it really works. I think it's a good thing to be able to adopt in a project like this. Uh, what I realised I should have mentioned earlier on is that after the glossy sightings get recorded on our website, importantly, Ro uh, Lauren puts all of those recordings into Bionet so that 
those recordings are available for the New South Wales government. If they're looking at development projects or any sort of other interference in natural areas, there are records either of the birds themselves having been seen there or of them having been feeding in that area, which is you know, a really valid, important record. We don't just simply need photos of the birds. Photos of the chewings is good enough evidence. It's really helpful. So once we've got a new bird, she goes into our database. I don't expect you to make any sense at all of this slide. It's just an opportunity for me to say, we are gathering so much information. And like so many projects like this, as time goes by, the more we're appreciating that bits and pieces of information that we just picked up incidentally are now actually really important. For example, this tail project that I was talking about, Initially, we thought it was all about the coloration on the bird's face, but now we're beginning to see that the tails are also telling us quite a lot of story about the identification. Uh, for example, I hadn't mentioned yet, males, some males also have tiny spots of yellow coloration. So sometimes we get a bird that's with, a, with an obvious male, but it's only got a little bit of yellow coloration and we can't be sure whether it's even a female or a male. Uh, whereas we're learning now because of Linda's work to identify the story that the tail is telling us as well about the bird. Anyway, heaps of data and we're hoping we can find a student that can come along and do some work with this because we've got more stuff to do and we want to be out taking more photos. So the outcomes of our project. We've achieved a high level of community engagement. There's so many of us in the Glossy Gang are so enthused about the project that we're talking to people all the time. We're talking to our Pilates teachers. We're talking to our hairdressers. We're talking to people in the street. And you know, nowadays in some parts of the corridor, if you're walking around with a pair of binoculars on, someone will come, will come up to you and say, are you looking for Glossy Blacks? Are you part of the Glossy Black project? It's, it's just really been great for the community uh, and for Glossies. We've had records of over 180 Glossies in the area. Well, Flossies in the area, and Flossie means a female, and so that means there's twice as many because a female is always with a male. Many of them have been photographed in more than one location, but so far, we haven't had any that have really flown 17 kilometres. They're invariably photographed in more or less the same suburb or maybe just one little hamlet or suburb over. They don't seem to travel very far at all. We've had sightings of more than 30 juveniles in the three years of the project, which is excellent, given that their uh, birds like to breed in hollows. Uh, and they have to really fight for hollows. We're, we're thrilled to have 30, but we'd like more. We've got a lot better understanding of the way glossies move in the project area. We had Sunset. Sunset is a, a glossy who was uh, photographed a number of times in the Buxton area and was photographed by a friend of mine on her property only two days before the 2019-2020 fires went right through her property and took out all of the feed trees and um, we had no idea what had happened to Sunset but subsequently only a few days later she was photographed just one suburb over feeding in another tree. Like the way that makes you feel is wonderful. We've had lots of records of sightings and evidence of feeding as Lauren told you which have all gone into BioNet and have provided a really useful database. We've been able to identify important feeding areas and specifically trees that the birds like so that the girls from our propagating teams have been able to go out, we can show them which are the best feed trees and they collect seed from those trees and they're propagating those trees for the um, plantings that uh, Lauren's organising. We've had a couple of occasions where Hazard reduction burns were going to be done in um, important feed tree areas and we've been able to explain to the fireys that you know, that's a really important area and please could they avoid 
doing a burn in that area, which they've done. They've taken on board. The fireys have been really supportive of this project. There has been other occasions when road widening was done in some country areas and feed trees were going to be taken out from the edges of the road and we were able to stop that progressing, which was fabulous. We've had contact with people in other LGAs and including you guys now, which is fantastic. And hopefully uh, we will continue to talk to other people in other areas so that the project can be widened for the sake of all the glossies. They don't know that they just live in Windsor Caribbee. They don't know about borders. For me personally, it's been so much fun. I've learned heaps and uh, getting me out there into the bush looking for glossies and looking for chewings has resulted in me and you know, the, the girls that go out with me in learning so much more about the wider environment so that now I'm really interested in gangings and I'm interested to hear Michael's next presentation about that in the hope that maybe we can do something along those lines too. That's only our little segment of the project. As Lauren said, there's quite a lot more to the project, but um, that's my bit of it. And I hope that you'll get the impression that it it's great to involve volunteers and that if you are a volunteer, you know, there's so much you can do for these endangered birds and it's really worth it. So back to Lauren. Oh, one more, one more um, uh, slide. Thank you to the photographers. We've got lots of photographers. These are the ones whose photos I've used in this presentation. And this is just my excuse to show you this gorgeous shot this is a juvenile glossy. When they're young, they have these yellow spots ventrally, uh, which they lose over time. We suspect this one is probably a female, although we can't be sure. So thank you very much, everybody. And back to Lauren. Thanks so much, Thanks Anna. So much Anna. Just wanted to um, let you know that there's other places that you can look. So on our website, if you want further information, and I'd just like to thank all of our partners and dedicated volunteers just like Erna for expanding our project beyond the reaches of what I would be able to do on my own. Um, thanks so much for having us here today as well and I think we're going to go to questions. Uh, thanks very much. <laughs> that, that was lovely both of you and uh, Erna your enthusiasm is just fantastic. Uh, <laughs> I've got a couple of questions here. One is from NX. I'm not sure exactly who that is. Uh, do you want to answer, ask that question yourself? I, could, I haven't got much experience can, with this, Mike, so perhaps you, if you ask. <laughs> uh, the question it. is, on breeding, do we know if glossies breed each year, conditions allowing, or are unlikely to breed if they have a juvenile from a previous year with them? Ah, uh, yes. Thank you for the question. Lauren, jump in if I get this wrong. Mm -hmm. Glossies will only have one juvenile per year if that... As I said, they breed in hollows, but they won't fight for hollows. And unfortunately, anyone else who wants that hollow ahead of them will get it. Uh, so, you know, the sulfurs and just about any other hollow breeder will go, go in and pinch the hollow. Uh, so glossies will produce one juve in a year. It takes a long time before that juve will fledge. And sometimes they keep the juvenile with them for 12 months, in which case they won't have another one the following year. So in a perfect world, they might have one a year if it survives. But yeah, it's really the odds are much smaller than that over time. Okay, the next question. Libby, do you want to ask that question yourself? You can't hear me, Libby? Lauren, is it Lauren? Uh, no, sorry, Libby asked the question. Do yes, you I, encourage, I, sorry, I was going to asking her, did she want to ask it herself? But the question is, do you encourage people to adopt their local glossy families and record them over time? If so, does this work in terms of getting good data over a long time period? I reckon you can answer that one, Anna. <laughs> Thank you. We don't have to encourage them too, Mark. <laughs> they just, they love it. Once you've done it, once you've got your bird and seen where it is, you know, people go out in hey almost <laughs> to find the bird again yeah we've got some fabulous photographers who are really committed to it um 
A lot of our photos are submitted where they're just uh, incidental findings when someone else was out birding, but we've got some committed photographers who will go out hunting glossies, uh, which, which we just love, yeah. yeah. Okay, the next question is from Cheryl Hook. Is there a glossy project running in the mid-north coast? All right, all yours. <laughs> That's actually my mum. Hi, mum. <laughs> um, so it is. <laughs> <laughs> there is definitely lots of glossies up there, but I don't know of a dedicated Saving Our Species project up there. We do um, have a community group up around Coffs Harbour that, that um, log their sightings. Um, but there is no dedicated project. So maybe maybe it's an opening for you, Mum. Maybe you need to <laughs> start your own Glossies project up there. I've given uh, Cheryl access to a microphone, so be only because it's your mother. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but she hasn't taken herself off mute, so she might be shy. Oh, she's asked her question, so that's all good. <laughs> okay, so the next one's from Lexi Meyer which is a question I've always had, but I've always assumed what the, the answer. If you see three glossies eating together at the same tree, are they the same family? Yeah, they are. So if you, that's one of the ways that we can um, tell breeding success as well. So all of that amazing data in that spreadsheet that you saw Erna showing before, um, it does um, have in whether they're a trio and that's how we can tell at the end of the breeding season, um, how many glossies have got a juvenile with them so that's usually the juvenile from this year or last year's juvenile if there it's been a hard season and it's actually really cute after the winter breeding season if you see them just fresh out of the hollow they're really bunky they're really funny they'll fall <laughs> out of the branches and they can't feed themselves properly because their mum and dad will still be feeding them um, like regurgitating seed for them and so you'll actually see them they'll be really cheeky they'll go and pinch the um she oak cones off their parents while they've, they've already picked them and they're feeding on them it's very funny to watch and it's also a good way of um finding glossies out in the bush as well because you'll hear the begging noise of the juvenile okay i don't have any more questions in the list there's, um, sorry, there's still there's a few here. questions in the okay. chat there sorry there is another one's come up another one from lexi uh, these all seem to be the same size. Oh, I guess that's a comment. Got another one, Luke Brown. Can you tell me the difference between yellowtail chewings and glossy blacks? Oh, this one's the age old question. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, glossies do have that modified beak. So they're chewings, once you get your eye into them, they're a lot neater and a lot more um, uh, regular. And also the end of the chewing where they're holding it will be a circular disc and like um, folks from Queensland call them orts that section that round disc at the, at the base and so that's usually how we detect whether they're glossy chewings versus yellowtail chewings which are a bit more just ripped apart and um, observationally as well yellowtails won't just sit in the tree for a long amount of time they'll just come through and have a little bit of a go at them and then move on whereas glossies will stay in the tree and work through the whole tree and that's when you get that really big carpet of chewings underneath the tree as well. Hope that answers your question. Okay, one more from Craig Dunn. How do we submit photos of glossies from the south coast? Oh, yep. Yeah. Anna, do you want to talk to it? <laughs> well, can anyone use our website? Or does it, should the south coast... I, I guess on the south... Yeah, I yeah, it depends it because like in our area, as Erna has sort of explained, we've done the glossies for um, our particular project area, but it sort of needs someone from the South Coast to set up their own flossies project. And cool. then you'll be able to match your glossies from your area to your database. And so we are always really open to if anyone wants to start up their own project down in other areas to help them do that and to tell them about how we did it. Um, and we also have some protocols and stuff with naming conventions that just help you get through the first little, where are we going to store all the data sort of stuff. But, um, <laughs> but in terms of adding them to our project, it probably wouldn't work because those glossies probably don't come to our area. They're probably just hanging out in their own area. But um, yeah, you could also use iNaturalist. I just saw in the, in the chat there to 
to log your um, sightings. But um, yeah, if you want to get a Flossy ID project up, let us know. Um, yeah. <laughs> you can always get to my email through our website. There's, um, there's a few things in the chat, which I, I, if it's all right, Mike, I'll just read yeah. those out. Um, yeah. we've, we've, we've sort of reached the end of the time, but we've got a few more minutes um, before we get ready for the gang gang. So um, Eric, uh, Red Tails will sometimes have last year's chick and next year's chick with them. Interest, interesting to see that glossies don't double up. So. No, they don't. Yeah, so um, and oh, she said, sorry, last year's chicken, this year's chick. Um, yeah, so uh, there's differences there. Um, Libby, uh, Libby, you you can ask that question. Um, yes, in terms of the project, where to put things, um, you could put it on any photographs on iNaturalist um, as usual, as we do with all of uh, any kind of species. But what we could do is to set up a project on iNaturalist, which has the same fields that you have in, in your project. So it would match, the data would match, because I think that would be more valuable to everybody. So it would be perfectly possible for us to do that. And if people are interested, that's something we could do. That means you don't have to store the data, but, but it'll be there if any scientists want to, wanted to compare different areas. Yep. It also encourages people to to submit sightings of glossies and feed trees, and then that can be protective in the future. Yeah. There's there's an additional, um, it's a comment really, uh, but there's a, a question and the uh, person has said, asset protection zone seems to depend on who does the assessment um, and can have an impact on feed trees saved. One assessor educated me that Allocasurina were fire retardant. Another assessor from the same area told landholder that Allocasurina were extreme fire hazards and had to go. Um, so the question is uh, sort of like a comment, perhaps educate APZ or Asset Protection Zone assessors to help with the protection of habitat. Is that something, Lauren, that is part of your role? Yeah, for sure. So. Um, I definitely do that in my area and I've been working with both park rangers and also RFS to to go into areas and assess um, the thickets of Alicajarina and to also just give them some information about um, foraging birds in that area. And so definitely getting involved, like also people like Erna as well, just being really engaged and they can also give that kind of information because it doesn't have to come from a threatened species officer like you can just go into those areas and find the records and find the birds and and then also give that information to the fire authorities letting them know because most of the time they just don't know that there's birds foraging in that area or they haven't surveyed it so more data and more more knowledge is the key to protecting these ecosystems fantastic and look there's a couple of other comments some very knowledgeable people in our participants thing um uh, Deb has said Carnaby's black cockatoos will also continue to support the previous year's young until the new chick fledges insurance policy. Eric has commented red tails do that too. Just find a food tree and visit it every day until the food's gone. Um, until comments about using the trees actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that can be pretty hard on them. Um, so um, Julie uh, has said uh, to hosts and panellists, we have started to encourage people to take photos of female glossy black cockatoos in the Eurobadala through the Eurobadala Natural History Society. And Danny um, uh, has said, I think cultural burn practitioners say that the aloe casuarine is uh, flammable in certain seasons, but not in others. I know they, you know, in a big enough fire, they go up with a whoosh. Um, so... Um, there's uh, different information and different times and different states, obviously, when it's dry and moist that affect that. Is there anything there, Lauren, that you could? Um, I, I won't talk to cultural burning, but in terms of the the birds themselves and, and Alicajarina as their food source, um, Alicajarinas are fire sensitive. So in a, in a low intensity burn, they'll store their seed up in the canopy and then hopefully won't be too affected by the fire and then they'll drop their seed after fire and regenerate. Um, but in sort of a moderate to high intensity burn or after drought, when the trees are already drought stressed and they've dropped their seed, a lot of the adult plants will die and a lot of the juvenile plants will die in fire as well. And so then it takes up, well, about eight to 10 years for it to actually produce enough um, nuts for, 
the glossies to feed on it. And it's only the female plants that produce the nuts as well. So there is that big lag time. And that's why we really have to think about protecting Alicajarina, even though it's a very common species, but just because it has that fire um, sensitivity and in terms of protecting glossy black cockatoos, we need to make sure that large patches of it don't get burnt and don't get burnt regularly. So I think, um, you know, low intensity burns and the patchiness and mosaic burning of cultural burning is, is a good way to go. Um, but also just educating all of our fire practitioners about the significance of keeping it in the habitat. Um, Libby, you've got your hand up. I just noticed it. On, this know. is just um, one from me as a, a sort of project manager, if you like. Um, we did get the information about glossy blacks being on the threatened species list and we um, we put stuff up on the website and we made posters and we talked to people but I'd be really interested to know how you promoted this to your people in your area to get the engagement that you have because obviously the engagement is very impressive so how have you been managing the project like that? Well, luckily we had some amazing community champions in our area already who had started doing little projects on glossies. So there was like this grassroots groundswell around glossies that we were able to tap into to start with. And then also luckily we weren't in lockdown. So we were able to do a great road show through our whole corridor where we went to community halls and we asked um, glossy black cockatoo experts from all over Australia, it was very exciting to come and talk about glossies and share their enthusiasm for them. And I also um, invited a whole, a whole lot of the landholders in that area. So the council did a big mail out for us. And we also um, promoted our projects through their Winter Carry web and all of the different Facebook groups as well for the different community groups. And we just got a lot of people coming to those um, initial roadshow. And then we've also kept that contact through um, doing talks at schools, doing NADOC day talks, and also through our newsletter. So we've been able to keep that groundswell happening. Even through COVID, we've, we've done really well going online. So yeah, and through community right. channels like Erna, yeah. The buses, I uh, think the buses. buses. You talk so, about that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I know we're running out of time. That. So um, yeah, we partnered with Red Room Poetry and um, Gundangara Elders to do um, a in schools uh, poetry and first languages program, which um, engaged lots of young indigenous people in our area to learn um, language and do poetry through language. And so we did a really nice schools project with them talking about conservation and with the theme of glossies and conservation around glossies, but then also them learning language. And um, then the, um, a few of the poems were picked and they were put on the back of buses in the Winter Caribbean Shire. And it was really beautiful to see the kids on the back of the buses and then all of these beautiful conservation stories with Gunungara words on them as well. So that was a really good outreach project. Thank you very much. That's great, Lauren. That's really useful to know. Great. So I, I think, Mike, we're up to you giving yeah. thanks. I think. <laughs> okay, I think we're wrapping up now. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Lauren and Erna. That was absolutely fantastic. I mean, people do love glossies, and I think that anyone who's been watching today will love them even more, as much as you do, I hope. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. See ya. Fantastic work, everyone. Now, um, look, we've got about five minutes before the scheduled start of the Gang Gang uh, session, and and you know, we're all very conscious of the amount of time we spend online. So we, we're giving you a, a couple of minutes intermission uh, where if you need to go to the, the loo or have a drink of water or boil the kettle or do something, you can quickly do that. And we'll start at 3 p.m. Uh, precisely. Don't leave the meeting. Um, just stay in here if you are staying for the Gang Gang presentation and we may have um, some other people join us. A fantastic turnout, um, Libby. We've got um, you know 50 plus people in the room, which just sort of um, highlights how concerned people are both about the bird and their willingness to learn more and try and do things to help them. Um, just while um, people are here and you can... Um, turn off if you don't want to see these screens but just to remind people that it is the Sapphire Coast um, 
Science Festival and uh, look, Libby through the Atlas, Bonda and a range of other organisations are involved in the Sapphire Coast Regional Science Hub and Sustainability Education Network and uh, Science Week, the Sapphire Coast Science Festival, Festival is uh, an initiative of those organisations supported by Inspiring Australia New South Wales and the wonderful manager Jackie Randalls who's based at Sydney University um, you know, these groups are supported all over the state. We know that science is important and we know that a scientifically literate community is vital for the, the, the um, conservation and protection of so many of our um, wonderful species. So um, this uh, effort that um, has been put on, uh, the Atlas and Libby's amazing uh, efforts, if you haven't been to some of them, um, they're all recorded and the, the videos are up there for you to view at your leisure if you want to. Um, there was a symposium with Bega Cheese about their sustainability programs on the Friday. The Atlas hosted the East Australian Hotspot um, Symposium. We had some wonderful scientists in there. It's a really valuable set of materials about what's happening on our coast with global warming and climate change and the impact that that's having on ecology. Uh, we had yesterday Kit Prendergast, who's the bee babette or babette. And uh, she's an ecologist who uh, studies native bees. That was really great. And we can't go past today without reminding people that yesterday we had the 10 year celebration of the Atlas of Life an, an amazing journey uh, that Libby and her team of volunteers have taken people on the amount of data the collected and the interest locally that's been generated by Libby's work and the work of the Atlas team has been remarkable. And if you want to know more about iNaturalist, Thomas uh, Masaglio uh, gave a really comprehensive little rundown for a beginner using iNaturalist. You could watch that little video um, and Thomas is doing other presentations as well. So there's things that have happened. There's things that are, uh, are going to happen. Um, on Sunday, we've got uh, a local student, Minka Waratah, the captain of Bega High School, and her father um, are talking about Tarthra Wharf and some of the amazing uh, critters that uh, live on the pylons there. They're a little bit concerned about... Um, not that there's a heritage restoration project going on, but it involves, um, I think, demolishing the existing pylons and um, they would like to see some efforts made to works that are sensitive to wonderful creatures like that nudibranch um, that's in your screen now. And uh, there's other sessions on Thursday the 19th, um, sorry, Friday the 20th, Joe Lane from Sea Health Products used to work for national parks, but looking at kelp and its um, uh, applications for health. Thursday, the 19th of August, David Howard from Clean Energy uh, for Eternity talking about sustainability and uh, his battery system on his house. And uh, he's been operating that for 12 months and doesn't get electricity bills. He gets electricity credits and he's very happy with how that's working out. So, and there are still tomorrow, we've got the science of nest boxes, echidna CSI, and on Thursday, forest monitoring and improvement with the Atlas. So it's a pretty big program. We're having lots of fun. There were lots of things that had to be postponed, but if you wanna be part of them, you can. So now I've got two minutes to get my cup of tea and do something. We'll reconvene uh, in a couple of minutes to hear from the gang gang people. Doug, if you want to give me the screen, I'll put the, we'll have a look at the glossy blacks on iNaturalist. Maybe not. Okay. Okay, so this is our website, um, and this is has all the 
background projects and things that, that we're doing. Um, it's got lots of resources, local stories and things like that. But if we, if we go into our, into our database, um, you can, we can have a look, we can see if we can find um, all the glossy blacks that we've got in our area here. If I can, if I can put the filter on. Okay, so this uh, this shows that we've got forty six observations uh, from. Sorry, Lily, we can't hear you. Um, can't hear me. Right, I don't know why. Oh, sorry. No, I got you now. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. So I've just um, put the filter on so that we can see all the glossy black uh, records that we have in in the atlas at the moment in our area. Um, uh, so we've got quite a lot of evidence of feeding and I know with your glossy black project that you've actually got, uh, you can tell whether it's a uh, recent feeding or, or older feeding. So we've got to start, but I think we'd like to do a lot more. So thanks very much. That was just a, a quick intermission to say that it isn't that we haven't got anything, but we, we could do a lot more. There we go. <laughs> Fantastic. So look, I don't have to really say anything um, other than to hand over to uh, you, Libby, because you're the uh, you're the moderator for this session. So you can keep going. OK, I'll do that uh, very happily. Um, welcome, everybody. And uh, special welcome to Michael and Stacey, who are going to be our presenters this afternoon of their research in the ACT onto uh, on gang gangs and their nesting um, and this this project's been going on since 2017 and there's quite a lot of uh, information that was discovered through this project which is actually new to science so it's really exciting for us and um, again we're interested in in perhaps doing more research in this area in conjunction with Michael and Stacy. So Michael Mulvaney is a, Dr. Michael Mulvaney, sorry, is a, an ex-government ecologist who worked uh, for ACT, New South Wales and the Commonwealth. Uh, he, and he's one of the supervisors of the Canberra Gang Gang Project and has been involved in several other citizen science projects dealing with fire and orchid occurrence, uh, competitor and predator interactions at superb parrot nesting hollow entrances, and the occurrence and ecology of the small ant blue butterfly and matching caterpillars to adult moth species. And I know that's only a tiny fraction of all the things you've been involved in, Michael. So um, very much welcome to you and uh, also to Stacy. Um, Stacy's a senior conservation officer with the ACT government and coordinates the National Gang Gang Working Group. Um, which includes many researchers, community members, local and state government representatives with a keen interest in the conservation of the species. And with support from the ACT government, Stacey is also embarking on a postgraduate research project to better understand the ecology of gang gangs within in the ACT. And might I say, I think that's a brilliant project to be working on. I think you'll have a lot of fun with that. So without further ado, can I hand over to whoever's going to talk first? There we go, thank you. Thanks a lot, Libby. Um, hopefully that's come up okay. Uh, apologies to everyone, I'm gonna keep my video off. I'm currently hot spotting off my phone and so I'm struggling with speed. Um, before the star of our Gang Gang show speaks, Dr. Michael Mulvaney, I'll just provide you with a really brief overview of the national priorities for the species as well as some information on how the ACT government and ANU, together with the local community, are working towards better understanding the needs of this iconic species. Um, Michael, do you briefly want to mention what you'll be speaking on? Uh, yeah, I'll just be uh, trying to spruik uh, <laughs> business and get people down the coast to uh, expand our project. Thanks, Stacey. Great. Okay, so in case we don't already appreciate how gorgeous these animals are, um, here's a picture of a very cute male that was captured by a community member in the ACT and uploaded on Canberra Nature Map. 
Um, gangangs are relatively small cockatoos. They're found in forested areas across Southeast Australia. Uh, like other cockatoos, they breed in hollows of live and dead trees within peri-urban and wilderness areas. Gangangs are a canopy specialist. They forage predominantly on eucalypt and acacia seeds, um, but they also eat insect larvae. And in urban areas, they're often seen eating a, a range of non-native species. Um, they love to eat fruits of hawthorns, et cetera, other, other, other non-native trees. As I mentioned, they're an incredibly iconic bird across their range. They have been the faunal emblem of the ACT since 1997. And they're also the logo of both the ACT Parks and Conservation Service and the Canberra Ornithologist Group, which is um, our leading community group who's undertaking bird research and education in the ACT. But despite their cultural significance, gangangs are really not well understood. Um, they're probably one of the least understood cockies in Australia, I think. So a better understanding of their ecology and habitat requirements is really required to inform conservation management decisions in the future. What we do know from a national perspective is that gang gangs are in decline. Over the last 21 years, there's been a drop in national reporting rates by approximately 69%. And due to dramatic declines in 2005, the gang gang was listed as vulnerable in New South Wales. It's now being considered for listing nationally as endangered. And um, this EPBC determination is likely to be finalised by early to mid next year. It's likely that declines in the population have been exacerbated by the most recent large scale wildfires. Um, these fires are believed to have impacted between 28 and 36% of the national distribution. And of their habitat that was burnt, uh, the estimates are around 60% that were burnt at high or very high severity. As part of the Commonwealth government's um, bushfire recovery efforts, $10 million was earmarked for native species uh, that were severely impacted by the wildfires. So a group of experts identified, I think it was seven mammals, an alpine reptile group and three birds as priority species for intervention. And um, this includes the gang gang cockatoo. So each species or species group was identified, um, that, were, that was identified was allocated up to $1 million each. To best decide how these funds should be spent, national working groups were established for all the species and species groups. And with support from the Commonwealth, the ACT government established and currently coordinates the working group for the gang gang. So this group includes, um, as Libby mentioned, community members, land managers, state and federal government reps, and researchers across the range of the species. It was late April when the, when the um, group first met and established a list of priority actions to improve the conservation status of the gang gang. And during this workshop, the group came up with many ideas, um, but that really acknowledged the importance of filling knowledge gaps through both formal and community research and monitoring and the need um, for immediate on-ground action as well. So the Commonwealth has provided in principle support to seven projects, totaling over $700,000. Um, the delivery agents, including ACT government, are eagerly awaiting the final approval processes to be completed, and we hope their contracts will be finalised by the end of this month. Um, but provided all progresses as expected, um, approximately $400,000 will go towards formal research. Uh, 177 will be spent on community outreach and citizen science. So this includes expanding BirdLife Australia's um, community outreach projects such as Birds on Farms, Birds in Backyards and Birds in Schools programs, and also expanding the citizen science data collection app Nature Mapper, which I'm sure Michael will discuss. And also $141,000 on habitat rehabilitation. And this includes trialing the efficacy of um, nest tubes by the Yorubadella Shire. Within the ACT, citizen scientists really have been leading the way to better understand the gang gang cockatoo. Um, community members regularly upload gang gang sightings to Canberra Nature Map and a dedicated bunch have been working um, to locate and monitor nesting sites. Thanks to citizen scientists, several key breeding locations have been identified in the urban area, and we are beginning to get a picture of the type of hollows gang gangs use. However, there is still so much we don't understand about the occupancy of gang gangs, their population size or habitat 
requirements across the region. The ACD government's application for Commonwealth bushfire recovery funding is primarily to undertake research to begin to fill these knowledge gaps. Uh, work will include undertaking extensive searches for key foraging and breeding locations with a real focus on Namadji National Park, which covers about half, almost half of the um, ACT, um, as well as areas within the Blue Mountains and Albury Wodonga. Funds will also be used to collect data on reproductive success by monitoring their survival and output of known nests in the ACT and Albury Wodonga areas. The ACT government's current focus on the species is also demonstrated in the support they are providing me uh, to undertake postgrad research with the ANU. This project aims to determine the occupancy of gang gangs across the territory and to better understand their habitat requirements. We'll gain a better understanding of gang gangs occupancy in relation to altitude, vegetation type and other habitat variables, including fire history. And we'll also identify new breeding areas to be monitored for reproductive success. I'll also aim to be developing a standard sort of survey methodology that can be used for gang gangs across their range. Um, given the interest and enthusiasm of our local community, a blitz approach to occupancy surveys is being trialled. So 100 sites will be distributed across the urban areas and Namaji National Park. These sites will bear no resemblance to the placement of the dots on this map. Um, and we'll be asking community members to select a small group of sites to record any gang gangs they see for five or 10 minutes at each site. So the Canberra Nature Map website will be a key tool in allowing community members to select their sites before heading out. Surveys of all the sites will be undertaken at around the same time and repeats will occur over three weeks um, at the end of September and into early October. We have begun spreading the word to our local community through existing channels and we have an Eventbrite page um, up to garner community interest. Now this QR code links you to that page, um, acknowledging that we're all in lockdown and nobody's expected to be traveling from New South Wales to here. If you do want more information about the research, um, pre and, and post surveys, please feel free to jump on that website and have a look. Thank you. I'll hand you over to Michael. Thank you. Um, hopefully it's okay because I actually can't see anybody. Um, Can you see the share the screen down yeah. at the bottom, the green thing? Yeah, are you, are you looking at my screen or not? No, I'm looking at mine, but you should have a green, a uh, little no. green square with share screen on it. If you press that, you should get the screen. <clears throat> we should be able to see but, what's uh, on your Mm. Oh, I just can't get out of much. Um, Mike, are you using a Mac or a... Yeah, a Mac. If you go back down to the bottom uh, bar and click on the Zoom camera, um, we can see you as a study in concentration oh, yeah. and observation, yeah. but if you click on that, that should bring back your screen. Yes, thank you. That's okay. Uh, that's fine. I hit share screen now. It's, uh... <laughs> Look, we've all been there, and um, if you like, I can edit that out of the video, but I think it's reassuring <laughs> for everyone else oh, out no, there. It's, that... uh... Are people seeing the, uh, the, the thing now? We are, yes, if you, you just, oh, that's it, perfect. That's Beautiful. Perfect. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thanks for that. Sorry for the uh, time, I hope it amused people out there kept, uh, as you entertained. So look, as Stacey said, um, the gang gang's in trouble and it needs our help and we know very little about it. And this is about how citizen science can get information on nesting and foraging and really the only thing we're then missing out is movement and having just had Erna and Lauren talk about how they're studying their, their movement, that sort of got me inspired to have a closer look at the, the bellies of gang gang. So 
who knows, you might be able to move into that third area. But, um, yeah, I'm hoping that we will be able to um, add the south coast to an area of study. So uh, Stacey mentioned that there's the Blue Mountains and um, uh, Albury Rodonga area, but we're also hoping that South Coast will be part of that. And there will be, if we get that support from the Commonwealth, there will be some funding and materials that we would be able to send you away. So first we'll talk about uh, nesting and the, the way we get citizens involved is we say, well, if you see gang gangs doing anything around a tree hollow, can you take that photo and down your part of the world, can you add it to iNaturalist? There's a project that I've set up called Gang Gang Nest Trees. Just go add an observation and add that sighting. That then um, gets into the system. And just to show how it works, um, and oh, sorry, once that, uh, once you put in an observation, you're asked questions about what the gang gang is actually doing around the hollow. And that just helps us prioritize the likelihood that actually that hollow is, is, is one that they're using for nesting. So obviously if they're in or entering the hollow, that's a lot more likely to be a, a nest site than one that they're just perched nearby. Just to say how it might work uh, down your way of the world, this is, Basically, in the Canberra area, there's uh, 15,000 odd gag gang records, and there's a lot down your part of the world as well. A lot of those are in the urban area, but they are pretty well scattered. So that's um, pretty daunting if you're saying, well, where are they nesting within that area? So we um, cogged up, uh, t t uh, teamed up with the Canberra Orthologist Group and said, uh, we asked people, to take those photos of gang gangs where they saw them around hollows and to put them on, well, in our case, it'd be Nature Mapper, but it's gonna be exactly the same for you down there on iNaturalist. And this is what they came up with. The bigger and darker the blue, the higher the priority of the site. So that's, they've got that behavior or there are multiple records from the one site. And we had, um, I think it was, uh, 149 people put up 136 uh, trees, which we then prioritised and, and got people to watch. But uh, actually people being what they are, they put their hands up and we had all the trees watched and then they'd be listening and they'd be hearing gang gangs next door. So we actually had more trees watched than what we asked to be. So we had about 150 trees that were watched by people. And from that, uh, we've identified 34 nest trees. So you can basically see that where we did find the nest trees was where you tend to, tend to get the clusters of those photos of birds around hollows. And where we got the actual trees was where we're getting those clusters of the, of the, the photos. So getting the photos does help you focus in within, but you can actually make a start from the records you've already got. Um, now, we actually asked people to stand and watch trees and that was pretty time consuming and it took a long time. Then we came up with a better method, which is what I think you should be using down the coast. And we would be providing one or a few of these down to you if, if, if you guys put your hands up for the project. So it's a, a, an endoscope on a pole, uh, which you attach a torch to because you've got to look in the hollow and the, the light on the endoscope isn't quite big enough. It's the same endoscope that your plumber puts down the pipe to see how where the blockage is. Um, we just put it on a pole and um, you can either use it to take a selfie of yourself or um, it's Wi-Fi, it's Bluetooth to your smartphone, um, or you can actually look in and see what's in the hollow and say, oh yeah, that is a hollow that, that's being utilised by a gang gang. And from about October to January, you'll you'll find a either you'll you'll find a gang gang in a hollow all the time. So um, it is pretty easy to check if they're there. We then ask people to observe a hollow once it's identified because we don't want to put that camera in 
uh, that that often. So yeah, once or twice is about the limit. Um, but you can actually also use that camera to check out, well, who else is interested in hollows that the um, gang gangs are using? So one of the, the things that the Blue Mountain people are really worried about is they're saying that the soft crested cockatoo is taking over all the gang gang hollows and that's why they're suffering. In some cases, it's, it's an 85% decline in gang gangs in the last sort of 25 years. Um, in their observations. Um, so not only can you get data on where gang gangs are, where those nest trees are, which you can then protect, but you can also start to get data on some of the competitors for, for those hollows, whether they're soft crested cockatoos or eastern rosellas. But also you can start to get info on some of the predators that might be involved and, and uh, yeah, the impacts of those. And, and brush-tailed possums are thought to be a threat, a threat to the gang gang, particularly in urban areas. So again, we've really got very little information, but this, would, this is a way that we can pull our information across the range of the gang gang and compare what's happening in Canberra with what's happening in coast, what's happening in burnt areas, what's happening in unburnt areas. Um, surprisingly, you find tree hollows are often flooded with water. Um, and that can be a bad thing for gang gangs, particularly uh, as climate change is predicting that we're going to get more intense, heavier summer rainfall when gang gangs are breeding. You actually can um, ha have chicks drown uh, because of water flowing in the hollow. But also um, tree hollows are pretty important water source for gang gangs. Um, and that's... A lot of the reason why you see gang gangs enter hollow is that actually they're going in for a drink of water. This is one of the hollows uh, myself and Roy were watching. And uh, one day we saw six different gang gangs go into this tree and we were saying, oh, what's happening here? And then that overnight we had one of the rare bits of rain we had that year. And the next day we came back and we noticed that these birds were just drinking from the top of the, the, the hollow. So yeah, um, it would be also interesting to know yeah, what percentage of, of tr trees have, have water in them and, and how they're being utilised by the gang gangs and how they might be important as, as that water source, particularly during drier times. From watching also, um, we do learn things about uh, gang gangs. So in the, uh, we've been watching gang gangs for four years and in the, 1919-20 season, we had uh, six behaviours that we'd never actually seen before. So one of those, we actually got death of chicks and we think those chicks died from heat exhaustion. Um, and we got four chicks that left the hollow prematurely. One got stuck on the, um, the edge of the, the hollow. Fortunately, dad managed to push her back after about two or three hours. Um, and we also had three fall on the ground and they were helpless, they couldn't fly. We actually were able to pick them up and put them back in the hollow, uh, two of them on the third tree. Unfortunately, it was in the botanic gardens and they wouldn't allow us to um, climb their tree. Um, unfortunately, the fledgling at the botanic gardens got predated. Um, we think either by a carwong or a fox. Um, and But the other two that were able to put back in the hollow, they actually were accepted by the parents and fledged and are, are still happily living today. So that was something we learned. But um, the gang gang is one of our cool temperate um, parrots. And you just see the dotted line on the top is the hottest temperature ever for a day over the last 100 years. And you can see that 2009, 20 years, we, we kept hitting the records and um, that last dead chick over here, um, as you saw in the photo, it was pretty, uh, it was pretty stinky by the time we found it. And we think it probably died around this time, around that hot time. So yeah, there is that uh, conclusion. And again, if we can identify tree hollows, we can start to do things like, um, put thermometers in them and just check, you know, is that temperature a real issue for the gang gang? So we, we can start to add to that. So yeah, finding hollows uh, is encouraged. 
another um, thing that, that we've done here is uh, the measurements from the hollows that we've found, well, only 12 of them actually did we provide at the time. Uh, we've since found more, but it's the, the data which has been used that people in Urubidella designed the gang gang nest box for came from data from 12 trees, but they're all our 12 trees. Who knows what happens down your part of the world and whether it's the same. So it'd be really good to get some other data into that um, for the nest box design. And tomorrow um, there's going to be an excellent talk on nest box and you can, I encourage you to be part of that. There'll be more of the, more talk on that. Um, but yeah, that, that, that's another thing that our data has provided. It has given that uh, figures for the design of the nest box, which is being trialled at the moment. The other thing I'd like to plug is the Hungry Parrots project, which is already up on iNaturalist. And um, you can add observations for uh, either gangangs or glossy backs. And um, it um, basically, from that, we can tell what I'm hoping is we'll get inundated with thousands of records of, of gangangs eating things. And from that, we'll be able to see, well, what food items are relatively more important than others. Does that change across the range? And if we identify more active nest, nesting hollows or nesting boxes, is the diet within a certain distance from a nesting box, does that differ than elsewhere? Um, but we just need that data first to actually start to drill down into, into to what they're eating. Yeah, sure, sure they eat um, wattles and eucalypts and exotics, but it's actually only a, a small portion of, of uh, wattles and, and eucalypts that they're actually eating. And, and with the exotic fruit, is that at particular times of the year or not? We, we just don't know. So it'd be really good to, to, to build up that record. So again, if, if, if we can have uh, people's records uh, for that, that would be fantastic. So um, this photo is from Sam. It's, I love her photography. Um, and We've, we've got a heap of volunteers of watching gang gangs for us, and we call them the gang gang gang. So, um, yeah, we, we'd love actually you to become part of the gang 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 too. Um, but just to uh, reiterate what, what we're trying to do, we're just trying to learn more about this um, bird so that we can better conserve it. If we find more nest trees, we can protect those nest trees we can protect them from clearance. We can protect them from fires. We can do things for that, but also we can then use that for, for research sites into the, the breeding success of the gang gang. Now in, in ACT, we have 1.4 uh, gang gangs per nest um, uh, born each year and, and our population steady. You know, why, why are we steady and we've had that big decline elsewhere? We really want to start to drill down and we want to compare our results with what's happening elsewhere. Um, so, yeah, really encourage you to find those, get people to put those sightings up and then to have a group of you down there who are prepared to go out with the cameras and check out those sites and record that data and then carry it further. For the diet, again, it'd be good to encourage people down there to put those sightings up of what they're eating, but also... I would like to make you managers of the two iNaturalist projects so that you can actually do just what I am, administer that, identify it, contact people, encourage them and support them. Um, so, yeah, that, that's basically where we're, we're headed. Um, I'm sure I've forgotten heaps, but we'll leave it there and open for questions. Doug, can you take this back for me? Because I'm fair to stuff it up otherwise. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Thank you very much, Michael. That was uh, that was fantastic. And Stacy, it's a, a brilliant project that you've got there. And it's not until you study things intensively like that that you really find out what's going on. As you said, you found out a lot of new stuff because of the work that you've done here. Um, I, I do envy you the number of people you've got going out and looking around Canberra. Luckily, you've got lots of uh, lots and lots of people there who are doing it but um we've got good, good guys down here on the coast and i'm sure that's the same up at Budawang too 
So um, let's have a look at some of the questions that we've got. Um, uh, Annie asked whether. Libby, do you want me to um, just give those people the microphone and we yeah, can surely. try That's that? Um, so yeah. Annie should be able to hear, be able to speak now. I've pressed the button, but um... yeah, we got it. Hey, Michael. Hi. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was just, I think you've answered my question, but I was asking about nest boxes, um, whether you'd tried those and how successful they were. And noting also that you mentioned the Yurubadala Shire Council project on the nest tubes, which I think will be interesting. So are you working um, with that project at all or providing advice on, on what you've learnt over time? Yeah, so to date, as far as I know, there's no record at all of a gang gang using an S box anywhere. So we provided the Yerubadella people with the measurements of the nesting hollows that we measured, actually like a fairly shallow hollow. Um, and it's uh, longer than it's wide, but anyway, all those measurements went to the Yerubadella Shire and they've got, uh, we've had a men's shed up here build 60 and they've built some down the coast and they're being trialled. Now, one of the things we found from our study is that gang gangs do like to nest in clusters near each other. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're putting in a nest box, which isn't near one of those clusters, the chances of losing it, you, them using it are probably low. So uh, to actually test whether the nest boxes are using, we want to put them up in known breeding sites. Uh, at the moment, we're the only ones who know breeding sites. So we're putting them up within a breeding area. Uh, well, that was about to happen. Hopefully after we can put them up after lockdown. Um, yeah, they're all, they're all sitting there ready to go. Yeah. Well, actually, we could do it in our hour. Look, I've been spraying roots <laughs> on Weed Hill in my hour activity, so why not if you do it on your own? It would be good exercise. It's okay. Big. Yeah, yeah, it's exercise. So, um, yes, but anyway... Um, yeah, hopefully in a year's time, well, we're probably expecting we won't get much activity this year. Just gang gangs check out hollows all the time and I wonder if they, they'll take a while to get used to them or whatever. But after two or three years of the trial, we'll, we'll see if they're using them or not. Okay, thanks, Michael. Um, and I think we've got an interesting question that's been raised by both uh, Sam and uh, Rohan here. Uh, Rohan, would you like to take the mic and, and talk about the difference between coastal forests and uh, ACT um, trees? Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes, lovely. Um, I think, Michael, you were saying is about seven and a half metres was the average nest tree, or the, the hollow, I should say. Yeah, that, that's right. Yeah. Um, Certainly within the tall forests, not just on the coast, but also up in the, um, on the tableland forests and even just the taller forests closer to Canberra. Um, I think you're going to be looking at hollow heights of around probably 15 to 30 metres. Oh. Uh, some, some of the, uh, the hollow heights where I've seen gang gangs nesting before. So I think the pole aspect is going to be outside that realm, but maybe another aspect could be getting climbers into those nesting sites in the non-breeding season and do measurements that way. That, that's um, a great question, Ryan. And actually, I uh, yeah, forgot I was going to mention that. So thank you. Um, yes, the pole that we've got, um, even if you've got it giving it to your tallest person, you're basically limited to 12 metres. <coughs> it's on a squid pole. <coughs> Excuse me. And the biggest quid bowl I can get is 10 metres. Someone has mentioned window cleaning poles, but I haven't been able to find any that are bigger than 10 metres, which are light enough to manoeuvre it. You sort of have to move things around to look into the hollow. But we didn't use the pole for, for our first couple of years when we discovered it. We basically had people volunteer to watch a, a hollow for 20 minutes at least four times. And we've found that it doesn't really matter the time. Different gang gang pairs are active out of things, but they do do a thing called changeover. And 
we can explain how to look for a changeover. The, the female spends the night in the hollow and the males there for some of the day, the female will come and back, but the female's there for the whole night. And just be, before that, there's this changeover at night and in the morning, and they have a particular call. So if yours can be there and, and if people are listening for that behaviour and that call, they can identify um, hollows fairly well. So you actually are right. You will need another group of people that are prepared to go and watch a, a hollow um, and, and check who, who's using it and whether, um, yeah, it, it's a nesting tree from our percentage rate is that roughly 10% of the hollows that we watched were nesting trees. So, yeah, it's you've got to have a fair, a fair crowd of people or people that are willing to go out and watch multiple trees. And we do have a few people on the spectrum who were willing to go out and do that, which was really great. So, um, yeah, thanks for that question. Um, yeah, Michael, thanks, Michael. Um, I think that's an interesting one. You had lots and lots and lots of records around the ACT. But if we're starting, again, I don't know what's on iNaturalist. I don't know what records we've already got. Um, but would you gather all the records that are uh, available already in terms of sightings and then choose places to go? Or would you suggest asking people to, to suggest likely places to go and have a look at? How would you go about attacking a, a whole area? Because it's a so, big area. So, so we joined up with the... Our, our bird group, COG, the Camel Hodgins group. And Rowan then, in his question, was saying he knew of some breeding trees. Now, he might know of some trees that are breeding trees, or he might know of trees where birds have gone into hollows. But he's not going to be Robinson Crusoe. I think there'll be quite a few people. You know, you've got a lot of bird watchers down there. So I would be tapping into what people already know. Mm -hmm. I think your records basically tell you. If you look where those clusters are, that's where you would go for a walk with your camera. And gangings are so generally so noisy. They're most active during September. They get a bit quieter when they uh, start nesting, which is about from October. Uh, they will go through till February, but it's we tend to see the first, the adults um, encourage the chicks to, to, to come to the entrance of the hollow before they fledge. So you've got about a week where you can actually see chicks at the top of the hollow, uh, right. that, those photos that I've had. So, and that's generally between Christmas and New Year's. So it's, it's a really good um, family activity. Uh, most of our volunteers are, are family groups um, who go out and watching um, the little gang gangs. So, I, I think probably um, maybe, we, obviously we, we'll separate the two the two areas, the, the Budawang coast and, and uh, the coastal wilderness, just because they're both big areas and different people. But um, as far as I'm concerned, it would be really good if we organized a, a, a Zoom call for anybody who's interested to come back and have you and Stacey um, talk to us and, and, and try and plan out an approach to this and see if we can get a gang, gang, gang going here. Um, obviously, we've got people like Sam, who's who's already worked with you and knows what's what goes on in this. So um, can I just say to everybody who's on the call um, that, that uh, we'll send out a, an email after the presentation and ask you if you're interested in that um, to, to sign. And then we'll we'll organize another meeting in the next uh, week or two, if that's all right, Michael. Yeah, look, and, and, and the, the thing is, for people to put their records on iNaturalist, historic photos, um, or even if they don't have a photo, just to put that record up. Um, and then I'm hoping that someone down there will put their hand up to start to coordinate mm -hmm. the, those records that go in and, and to checking them out and to prioritise which ones yeah. uh, to see. And look, it's even if someone tells you precisely the locations of a tree, and even if you know the tree, sometimes it's really hard to actually find the hollow. So it's really good to contact the person who's made the sighting and to go out with that person when you first go and look at that hollow. Um, 
So everybody knows which one it is. And if, if somebody's taken the trouble to photograph a bird on the hollow, they may well be interested in going back on a regular basis to, to look to see. Yeah, it. look, it's, it's the same with what Erna and Lauren found. Once they've taken that, it becomes their bird. <laughs> and right. they really they really look after it. It's fantastic. Yeah. So that's all good. So um, I think that's what we'll we'll do following this. Um, okay. There's a, there's a question from questions. Lou. Um, there's a question from Lou, and I've given him access to the microphone. Or Lou, if it, it's he or she. Hi, Lou. You build nest boxes. Can you unmute? Then you can talk to to everybody. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm a member of uh, Eden Men's Shed and I make um, nest boxes when people order them. I've made them for our Azellas, um, kookaburras, um, all, all sorts of birds. I've made a number of them and I would like to try and make some for the Glossy Blacks and Gang Gangs that are in my local area in Womboyne. So I think if you come to the presentations tomorrow, which are about the science of nest boxes, and there will be information and links to uh, the specifications for, for particular birds. And we're, we're focusing at the moment on glossies and gangangs. So um, I think tomorrow there may be a few more answers, uh, a bit more information that will help. And it would be great if you are interested in doing that. And, and that's great. Look, we're still working out uh, whether gangangs will use next boxes and what's the best design for a gang gang. So I think we're probably at least a year away before we'd be asking uh, your men's group to make uh, boxes, but uh, certainly glossy blacks, they've been used on Kangaroo Island, uh, that the nest boxes and they are utilized. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, it, your group can start with, with the glossy blacks um, because yeah, they're a bit more advanced. Uh, the yeah. My wife and I have watched um, both glossy blacks and glossy blacks, red, uh, yellow tail blacks, and gang gangs eating um, seeds at the back of our place. Well, actually, right on the on, on now the border with our with our neighbour, uh, and they stay there for hours and hours and hours, just chewing, and you can hear them all over the yard. Yeah, they're, they're great things. So I look forward to seeing your, your photos on iNaturalist, Lou. Uh, well, my wife takes the photos and she's got one there of a male that looks like he's got a Mohican haircut. Yeah. Oh, well, that, that sounds good. That could be the poster boy. <laughs> okay. And we've got a question from Amanda, Amanda Kay. Hi, Amanda, would you like to talk to Michael? Or Stacey, I'm hoping. Or Stacey, sorry, Stacey, yes, it's good. we can't see you. <laughs> Stacey's, okay. Stacey's good with the bigger picture. Hi, Amanda. Okay, well, I'll read Amanda's uh, question out because she's She's not managing to talk. It says, we've got gang gangs feeding in the peppermint gums on our property in the Blue Mountains. And we have loads of hollows, but we've never seen a gang gang near a hollow. Wondering if they nest close to where they feed or further away. We don't know. Uh, we don't even know how far they go when they've got young. So um, I think you've got to look look in the breeding season and outside of the breeding season. So the breeding season is that October to January. So I think they're more likely to be feeding closer to where they nest during that time. Uh, but I'm only guessing. So hopefully with the study that the group up in Blue Mountains are doing and that you can get involved in, uh, you'll be able to answer that question that <laughs> I can't. That's it's always good when a scientist says, I don't know. I like that. There's lots to find out, isn't there, Michael? There is. <laughs> right. Questions from Craig there. Um, Have we? Uh, sorry, I can't see that. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, Craig, can you hear me? Yep. Yes, Craig. 
Yeah, I was just wondering um, if you've seen any changes in um, detections or the distribution of detections or movement patterns um, since the fires in the gang gangs. Um, I know they're not as susceptible to food losses as the um, glossy blacks are, um, but certainly the um, eucalyptus and wattle seeds that they feed on have taken a, a large hit in, in large swathes of the south coast where um, where the canopy was consumed. Um, yeah, wondering if you've seen any changes in distribution and when you think there might be enough seed for them to return to those areas. Look, um, until very recently, you were allowed even to put um, leg bands on gang gangs because they're just these magnificent chewers. So yeah, banning them for movement is pretty well impossible. So it's pretty hard to tell um, how they're moving through the landscape and there just isn't that information. Now, maybe we can get inspired by what they're doing with the flossies um, and maybe use that approach with the gang gangs. Um, so, look, we're in the dark and there isn't a lot of work being done on gang gangs. So um, I think the work that Stacey's doing, which will be looking more at how they're distributed across the landscape, is going to be able to answer that a bit better. But at the moment, we don't have much information. Stacey, do you want to um, add to yeah, I, I don't have anything um, to add except to say that there has been um, very anecdotal um, observations of changes in their movement. So gang gangs are meant to be altitudinal migrants where they, um, you know, they're in the winter lowlands in the winter and in the warmer months they go into the highlands. Um, whether that's the case everywhere, it's sort of, you know, the verdict's still out. But there has been anecdotal evidence to suggest that they might be staying longer, um, that their seasonal migration might be changing. We don't really know whether that might be um, attributed to climate change or potentially changes in, as you said, some of their foraging species being smashed by the fires. And so just changes in the distribution of what's, you know, what's edible at what time. So um, again, we don't know, but hopefully doing, um, looking at occupancy surveys this year, we'll get, you know, we'll get a, a good understanding of, of how they're distributed depending on um, altitude, but also, also um, key foraging species. I think it's very exciting for the community, the people that are interested in birds and interested in what's going on, to be at the beginning of, of a, a project or a you know, learning curve like this. So I think it's a, a really exciting thing for us to, to be involved in. And we've got um, Julie Morgan down here, uh, who's a great bird watcher from Eurobadala, is saying um, they've noticed a big move into eastern forests after the fires in the Eurobadala. And for our own bird watchers down here on the far south coast, um, Barbara Jones um, saw, I think, 41 um, glossy blacks um, all in one place at Nethercote, um, which are numbers she's never seen in a whole lifetime of bird watching. So um, we've got people that are observing things. It's collecting all that information and bringing it together so that we can, um, we can understand more. So I'd like to thank um, all our presenters today in terms of sh giving us really, really interesting insights into a whole uh, new area of, of research that we can be involved in. It's been very exciting. And as I say, what I'll suggest, if Doug, is, is this okay in terms of privacy? Can we write to everybody who's, um, who's been involved in the presentations today and tomorrow with the nest boxes and ask them if they're interested? Um, Absolutely. We, we'll have a list of everyone's, um, that's one of the reasons we get people to register to get their emails and uh, <laughs> they can just delete it if they don't want it. And uh, I'm sure people are happy with that. But if they're not, they can, they can send try. me an email as the host and say, don't send me any more emails. I don't think we were that bad. I thought it was an ex excellent presentation today by everyone and uh, just a fabulous way for a lot of people with common interests to connect up with people like you and um, Michael and all the other presenters, Libby. Yes, it's, it's superb. So um, we'd love to be involved down here, I'm sure. And I know the people at Badawang are as well. So um, we look forward to that. So you'll be hearing from us in terms of how we can get involved. And Michael and Stacey and Lauren uh, and, and we'll be contacting you again to 
hear more about it. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you everybody who's joined us. And look, just a reminder to everyone that when I end the meeting, I think it takes you to a closed screen. You should see an evaluation from Inspiring Australia. It is important to them to get that data because they have to go cap in hand to the government to get money. And, uh, and it's important for us because if you all fill in the evaluation, when we go cap in hand to the people that have gone cap in hand to the government, we'll get some money to help support these events. So please fill in the evaluation. And I made the suggestion that if you wanted to do two, one for the gang gangs, one for the glossies, that's fine. But if you just wanted to lump them together, that's good too. And uh, thank you very much for everyone. And uh, as I always say, it feels rude to just pull the plug on you all, but you're probably relieved after a couple of hours in Zoom. So go well, stay safe. And if there's anyone listening who's, uh, well, we're all in lockdown, but there may be some people interstate. If there's someone in Western Australia, we had the B, uh, Babette, she was from Western Australia and she was um, saying that things are pretty good over there. So if you're, if you're living the life, uh, good on you and we'll hopefully get back there as well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Doug. Thank you very much. Cheers.